Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So I'll quickly say that again. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us. And before we get started, I just have to give you our standard disclosure. Um, we are recording this session <laughs> now. Thanks to Phil. Um, so if you're on the LAM or if you're in witness protection or you just don't want us to see your face, just uh, please keep your camera off. And depending on your questions, it's very likely that we're going to talk about a specific stock or maybe a product that's not endorsed by BI. But just know that all that information, everything that we share tonight is the opinion of the Education Committee members and not specifically the opinion of BI. And you know we're not trying to give you investment advice and we don't suggest that you run out and buy any of the stocks that we talk about. But if you do hear something that sounds interesting, absolutely uh, do, go ahead and do your own research because that's what BI is all about. Um, Dan, do you want to try talking and see? Because Dan's having trouble with his with his um, stuff, but do you want to try talking again and see if we can if we can hear if he sounds echoey? Chris, are you getting an echo? No, it sounds okay to me. Is anyone else getting an echo from Dan's audio? No, nothing from Dan. I got it. Okay, next slide. Well, the agenda, we're gonna first talk about the OLC and the presentation will be about the importance of quarterly data. Uh, following that, there will be an open discussion with questions and answers, either about the presentation or any other things that you would like to bring up. Uh, and um, then we'll, we will, in that part of the presentation, probably talk about some of the other better investing resources. And then there'll be a close in uh, between an hour and 75 minutes. Next slide. So I want to welcome both OLC and if there are non-OLC members, I'd like to welcome them. And I'd like to say a little bit about the online chapter. I think people are getting now, so they know it better, but it's the chapter that serves people who are not in a geographically defined chapter. So it's the chapter that makes it true that every BI member now has a chapter to which they belong. It's the largest chapter with about 3,000 members, probably about three times as large as uh, the next largest chapter. Uh, the OLC has programs and functions like a regular chapter, but it also has unique fe features including that we do everything online. We're so geographically dispersed that uh, we are not able to do things in face to face, except I'll get to this when I talk about satellites, uh, through satellites. We have a worldwide membership. About 10% of our members live either in Canada or scattered across the globe. I don't know how many countries, but several. We have these things called satellites. They're in some ways like a chapter, but what they really are is they're clusters of experienced OLC members who coordinate and help in geographical areas. And I think now we have seven of them. So, the final thing I want to say on this slide is that every other month we have one of these educational workshops, often with some kind of an introduction, and then we want to have time for people to ask their own questions. Next slide. So here's the way we run these webinars. First, we ask you during Serum's presentation to turn off your mic. And if you have questions or comments during the time he's presenting, put them in the chat. 
After that, if you want your mic open and it's not getting extraneous noise, that's fine. Um, and you can ask questions verbally. Um, I want to say that closed captioning is available. And I believe the way it will work for you is in the lower right hand part of the screen, there's a place that says three dots and the word more under it. You click that, and then what will come up is uh, you can say, uh, show subtitles, and uh, that will, uh, if you click that, it will show you the subtitles. So uh, that's how, if you want the closed captioning, you can get it. The slides and the recordings of this webinar and other webinars are archived on the OLC website, and it takes about two days for them to be uploaded to the website. So those are the practices for today. And um, I'm turning things over now to Sarum, who will talk to you uh, about the importance of quarterly dividends. Thank you, Dan. Not quarterly dividends, the quarterly data and the trends of those data. Thank you. Um, for those of you I've seen uh, about five or six names that were present on Saturday for the Yankee Model Investment Club uh, meeting. During that meeting, a version of this was presented. I'm going to disappoint you because I'm going to repeat the same thing what I told on Saturday. So please bear with me. And But once I finish, we can have discussion. I don't think we get a, much of a chance to discuss. So now is an opportunity. I've stolen this idea from the lady that presented at the Pink 22, Kathleen Richards. And towards the end, I will put a, a link to it and her presentation, you can access it. In her presentation, absolutely. My only challenge with that is, I hope you can see me now. My only challenge with that is I am running on a battery, uh, uh, my battery is dying on my, my uh, computer and probably, hopefully it'll carry for the next few minutes. Thank you. Um, so the presentation that um, Kathleen made, she, she has, I think, she spoke for nearly about an hour and a half or so, more than 100 slides. I'm trying to capture the essence of it in three or four slides here. So bear with me and hopefully we can discuss as we go forward. One of the things she emphasizes is discipline. Discipline of investing is very important. As you all know, people have been very disciplined about investing are successful. And she put this, fail to prepare again, the whole process of what we do using SSGs and how we do it. It's all part of the preparing for future. So th that's a good Ben Franklin's um, quotation there. And she has a wonderful slide. Uh, I didn't want to copy, but I just wanted to let you know that she, she shows pictures of all the people with all these different emotions. And her point is sometimes emotions will determine the actions we do. And, and she said that it can be detrimental to investing, which is, which is absolutely true. Um, I, I personally believe many times we react ignoring logic and we impulsively make decisions, especially on today or earlier last week, if we have seen something drastic happening, we have a tendency to react poorly to it. 
But at the end of the day, the importance of what I'm trying to say is data will dictate our actions and that's how we need to treat this. Please go to the next slide. So when do we need to pay a little more attention to this quarterly data? Again, I think throughout the process of investing, we should, before we buy a stock, if you are watching a stock for your personal use or as part of your club, that's when you need to pay attention. Managing a portfolio, especially to make, sell or hold decisions, or sometimes buy more of decisions. That's also this quarterly data can be helpful. And I, I personally like to do this is after we sell, we can still do these analyses. Please go to the next slide. Simply when we talk about quarterly data, there are a couple of things we want to keep track of. One is pre-tax profit. The second one is profit margin. In both these cases, how they are moving and the slope of it, how fast or how slowly it is moving, that can really help in tracking this information. On the graph, this is an example of a um, study we conducted last week. You can see the annual data from 2012 to 2021. But after that, you have those two open circles that those are the quarterly data before we reach to year 2022. You can see overall the pre-tax profit is going up all through this period. But if you look at the, specifically look at the quarterly data, they continue to be moving in the same direction up, but the slope is increasing. That means they're moving a little faster than previous years. So obviously if you project that, probably this graph will be out of scale by 2022 according to this. I want to remind you a couple of things that we always base our understanding and education of the whole investing process. Sales, they drive the profits. And profits, they drive the earnings per share. And earnings per share, that drives the price. So if we keep the track of sales, but also that profit and the profit margin, hopefully that will give us clues in understanding the variations in EPS and then the price. So for some reason it's gone forward. Can you go back a couple of slides? Thank you. So, so by keeping track of this, profit and profit margin, hopefully we can either observe or even predict the price. That's the, that's the essence of this presentation. Please go to the next slide. Like I said, when you look at the pre-tax profit, I'll show you in just a second where we can see this in our SSGs. Um, how it's moving, how fast it's changing. And then if it's going down, um, one of the things that Kathy, Kathleen, she specifically uh, mentions what her, her concept of torpedoes. If it is the pre-tax pre profit data indicates they're falling, they're falling for one, two, three, four consecutive quarters. That's when she compares them to torpedoes. Her simplistic way of explaining this is if you hit four torpedoes, it's time, it's going to be a bang. That means you're going to explode with this process. You're, you're, you're probably losing 
your price. So that's that's the that's the explanation behind this. So keep track of this while we look at the pre-tax profit. Please go to the next slide. This is where we will actually find the this information, this quarterly information. The in the SSG plus. You can go to this screen called quarterly data. And this is what we get. We get sales, which is not highlighted in this. That typically comes in blue. This pre-tax profit comes in um, this purple or pink, whatever color is. And then you can also add earnings and pre-tax profit over sales. All this information, and you have several options you can select in this. Um, where it says select data type, you can select quarterly or trailing four quarters. Trailing four quarters, it smooths, smooths the, the process. And you won't see the sharp changes, but there are a little more uh, curved changes. In the second in the middle panel, you see show reference lines. You can actually compare these changes with either sales growth or EPS growth, or you can, for example, here zero growth that you can see that'll that'll put a line. Um, and then you can look at last five years, or in this case, I believe, yeah, I selected last five years, or you can look at the whole 10 year data. And also you can, if the variations are really fast, you can change it to limiting it to 50% of the growth. I hope uh, this gives a big picture of what we are looking at. It. Please go to the next slide. Again, I, I personally, I look at sometimes to me, looking at this makes a little more better sense, but for some people graphs are better. But if you can look at this change uh, from March, 2013 to December 2013 in those four quarters, you can see negative 30%, negative 28%, positive 32%, and you have 723% change. And then you have the following quarter, 300. So it's a very fluctuating, you had two quarters of drops and it picked it up again. If you are interested in looking at the data by tables, this will also give you a good picture. To me, this gives you somewhat magnitude of, you can see the numbers that probably a little more effective than looking at a graph. Please go to the next slide. I think I have a couple more of these same slides that gives you the data, but you, you, can, you can take a look at that. In the, this period, it's a little more stable, but still you have, some outliers in this table. Please go to the next slide. Yes, but you can see when the variations are strong, you can see some of the percentage change in sales continues to be somewhat stable. There's no direct correlation all the time, but in many cases, you can actually see there is good correlation. If it's going up or going down, you can see that also. Please go to the next slide. Think back to graph, I guess. Yes. So again, the sales versus pre-tax profit, you can see there is some general correlation, but it's not always the case. Sometimes, um, the sales may be going up, but the profit margin may not be. For example, right in the middle, you can see the sales is stable, but there's a drop from June of 2018 to June of 2019. There are one, two, three, four, five spots that, that five quarters of data that indicate that the tax profit is going down. 
So if you look at something like this, maybe second or third quarter, you realize, oh, this is heading into some trouble. That's when you want to take advantage of your knowledge. Please go to the next slide. I think here I added the earnings again. There's no direct correlation between earnings and profit margin. For example, in December of 2018, after two quarters of losses, I mean, after two quarters of dropping in the pre-tax profit, you can see um, the earnings has gone up. So obviously, uh, it looks a little more rosy than it needs to be. But if you go follow the um, 2019 June through almost 2020, you can see there's a steady increase 2020 September. So one, two, three, four, five quarters of increase. Again, keeping track of that would help us probably when you see it's going up a couple of quarters, maybe that's a time to buy this particular um, particular um, offering or particular um, stock. Please go to the next. Again, this is uh, one ascent group. I know many of our clubs do have this um, in their portfolio. The big drop right there is the COVID drop 2020 March. But before that, you can see there are few, at least one or two quarters before that, you saw there's a drop in the in the price after almost a year of really good rise. If you go to next slide, I think I have a comparison of these two for ascent. You can see in this, you have pre tax profit. There are a couple of signs here. Number one is December 8, 2018 to December 2019. There is a slight, um, there's a slight uh, movement to the downwards movement in the pre tax profit. Every quarter, one, two, three, four quarters, you can see it dropped. So obviously that is an indication. And then um, following the, following the uh, pandemic, you saw in June of 2020, it certainly did go down. If you go to the next slide, there's a slight comparison between the, these graphs and the, and the, Price. I tried to, I'm sorry, this is not a very good graph because I stretched it both horizontally and vertically to grab them into the same screen. And I tried to keep them at the same scale, but it, it doesn't seem to be the case. But I just want you to take the point between 2019 at the bottom, you can see if you go all the way up, corresponds to December 2018. You can see there's a slight downward trend in all this four quarters as I was showing in the previous slides, which was a little more dramatic because of the scale. But- so Sphere, I'm, Sphere, I'm yes. going to interrupt you for a minute just to make sure that we're, so that if we were looking at this quarterly data way back yes. in 2000, whoops, sorry, I touched my screen and it made it. Yeah. But, but yeah, back in, it looks like in 2018, we would have seen that there's four quarters of, of downturn and we would have sold yes. right at the yes. top of the market. And exactly. Then, right. So that's what I guess what we're yes. trying to yeah, no, point my out. Point, right? yeah, that's, that's exactly you hit on the point. What I'm trying to say is even before the pandemic drop, we could have seen this coming. And we right there or slightly before that, we could have made a decision on, and actually some people actually did. Kathleen said she did, and she she benefited from that. Anyway, so that's the point I'm trying to make. 
and that that that's what the the data tells. Um, but having said that, if you can look at the next four quarters, of course, that was highly um, influenced by the pandemic. You saw the four downward trend in June, September, December, and March of 20 and 21. You can see those, even though they went up, the price has gone up, almost came back to normal. But again, that is a that is an an aberration that is a an outlier. Anyway, I thought the 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 paying attention to quarterly data has its own benefits. I think at this point I'm going to stop talking and please jump in and let's discuss. Um, is there one more slide? Oh yes. Um, those of you who have access, please go to uh, Better Investing and look at the conference Bink uh, handouts. And under 238, the power of quarterly graphs, I think this is where Kathleen uh, made those presentations. You can see that, like I said, it's like 100 plus 115 slides or something. You can see there's a lot more details on that. Please go to the next slide. Yeah, this is this is summary plot. Probably please leave this slide on, Chris, and we can discuss. Um, anybody wants to jump in and ask questions or anything? Okay, is there something in the chat? So, so Shiram, are there? A, I think when we, because you and I both saw the presentation at Bank. And she had several examples of stocks that uh, if you would have been looking at the quarterly data, you could have both bought and sold at the perfect time because the the pre-tax profits and, and were were predicting a change that had not yet been reflected in the price. That is correct, yes. Do you need to unmute everyone? Or oh, they can unmute themselves should be able to unmute themselves if they have a question. I want everybody to ask questions and <laughs> participate in the conversation. Sri Ram, this is Jack. I have a question. Um, I find at least for some companies, they have um, quite noisy um, um, quarterly data that for one reason or another their their company is more seasonal so it's it's harder to interpret but um, I so you don't get those those clear trends quite as easily as something's going wrong because there's a seasonal trend that makes it choppy um, yes. I'm yes, not sure but, what to do about that, except that that those companies might still be worth buying, but it's just hard. You're you have a more difficulty trying to find these signals that you're talking about. Absolutely, but again, if it is a cyclical and if it uh, comes on seasonal, what you can do is um. What you, what, you, what you can do is you can, for example, I know you have the skills to do it too, maybe in the, do your own graph and eliminate those seasonal variations and see if still there is a trend or if the trend is something that we can account for those changes, seasonal changes, but still even within the seasonal changes, is it reasonably, higher or lower than what you expect for the seasonal trend. Yeah. Well, and also there, what, what Kathleen was recommending is four quarters. So you don't want to make a decision yeah. based on one or two quarters. So that, that should also take into account those annual, you know, variations for things like, you know, retail type stock and stuff. Yeah. And saying that another way, um, you could also look year over year. 
So fourth quarter last year versus fourth quarter this year should be as close as possible to apples to apples, except of course, if you run into a worldwide pandemic or something like that, that yeah. you can explain away. Yeah. So there was a question in the chat. Um, is four quarters a hard and fast rule? Um, I think Jack has ans answered that question. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, if you have steady four quarters of a single trend, it certainly is. Sometimes it may be too late in the fourth quarter. So that's why on this slide I said, do not buy when we are two or three quarters of decline or for pre-tax profit, you may, you may want to understand that. Again, not wait till the fourth quarter because it may be too late. So again, it depends. I think probably it needs a little bit of learning and understanding how these things go. So how comfortable you individually are or how, um, how um, your club and your club investing philosophy is, I think based on that, you can make that. And also it was my impression in the presentation that this is maybe just like a, an indicator that you wanna get a little deeper, dig a little deeper, see what else is going on and why are, for example, pre-tax profits going down, you know, mm -hmm. is there something that we, so you might be doing, it might cause you to do some research that you wouldn't do if you weren't looking at the quarterly data. Very yeah. true. And another thing sometimes, <clears throat> um, you know, it's it's not, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's somewhat subjective as far as, you know, is it two quarters, is it three quarters, is it four quarters? Um, again, depending on what's happening with the entire market, um, some people want to may, you know, may take action earlier than later. Um, you know, this has been a very, very, I don't know if there's a better word, strange market this past week, this past month, this past year, um, year to date. So, you know, looking back is always, you know, great. But how do you anticipate, you know, you know, here and now kind of thing? And and who can call the bottom of the market and when's going to be the most opportune time to invest kind of thing. So um, when you do sell something, just keep in the back of your mind, do you have somewhere better to put that those funds? Because you have to make the decision of if you're going to pull it out, where you're going to put it, or potentially just keep it in cash and on the sidelines until you find something better. Very good point, yes. I don't know, do, do people want us to read like um, people's comments in the chat? Like Phil, do you want to read most comments or does everybody just want to read themselves? <laughs> I think sure. it'd be, yeah, nice sure. if, be nice if somebody would read them in that way, we can all. Um, I, I, don't, I don't mind asking my own question. If you okay, mind. go for it. <laughs> so, um, I think this is really cool. I'm, I'm a, a real newbie here, um, but I'm a stock watcher of particular stock in my, in my club. And it's a technology stock and they're having trouble now. And, but I really think that long-term it's a good stock, but yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's actually now one, it's got, it's two quarters into a downturn. Um, but I, I, I just don't feel like we should be selling it if we're really looking five years out. It, I, I really think this is a stock that five years out will, will have done us um, some real benefit. And so the idea that, you know, you just wait four quarters, I mean, that's only a year. If you're really a long-term investor, shouldn't you go beyond a year? Excellent point, yes. I think uh, that, that that is, again, for example, if we, if we, almost every single um, stock for the last four quarters or three quarters, it showed some of these trends. And some of them are fundamentally 
very strong, but because of the market, because of what's happening around us, so there's no consistency into it. So in a year like this, I completely agree with you. Does it even make any sense? Well, but that's why we're not looking at the price of the stock. We're looking at the pre-tax profit. So, I mean, just because maybe the market's crazy, that shouldn't impact the profit margin of the company, should it? Well, that's where you might have to dig a little deeper because depending, you know, what could potentially being impact um, your, your potentially your sales or your earnings could be supply chain. You know, if they're not getting the parts for whatever they're doing or making or whatever, you know, that's where you got to kind of understand, um, you know, what's kind of going on underneath. Um, yes, I did put the link to Kathleen's original presentation. Those of you who are members of BI, I'm assuming all of you can access that and go through that. And there was a question about are the slides available? Yes, um, as Dan pointed out at the beginning, the recording of this as well as the slides will be made available in a couple of days, actually. And you can probably look for those on the uh, local events website where this uh, seminar was mentioned. Yes. At this time, do you want to, are there other questions about the quarterly data or should we take the slide down and open it up to general questions? Actually, actually I have one more question. Um, we're talking about if it drops for three to four quarters in a row, then that's a problem. But what about those instances where it actually goes up for three or four quarters in a row, but then drops back down and this, it, you know, this particular stock that I've been watching, um, there's been a few times, in fact, just recently where it's gone up much higher than the sales have gone up and then it's dropped back down. So do you need to factor that into the decision? Mo, when you say it go, it's going up, is that the price or the profits or what? What metric are you looking at? I'm looking at a graph right now that is just the sales and the pre-tax profit. And so it did just drop precipitously in the last two quarters, but for three quarters before that, it went up compared to the sales. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is challenging, yes. Um, but do you know what period uh, that it was going up. And for example, if you looked at most companies, maybe uh, middle of last year to end of last year, they were all going up, the pre-tax profits. Mm -hmm. But even the first quarter of this year, they were all going up, even though the prices were coming down. Yeah, well, in this case, it was because of China and Russia. That, yep. that they were dropping. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, some of those things, again, we need to consider into overall picture. But going back to your question, if somebody bought it, when it's going up two or three quarters up and the price was still low, you know, they, they would have lost again in the short term, yes. But in the long term, are there, I mean, one of the points that Kathleen was trying to make was in a normal market and if everything is as usual, if you see these kind of trends, those are helpful in answering if there is something fundamentally wrong with the company that is going on. Yeah, and she did but, say that when you see stuff going up, that can be a buying opportunity, especially if the prices are still low. Yep. So, thank but, you. This, this is really, really helpful. I've never looked at the quarterly data before, so thank you. This has been wonderful. The other thing I think you can do that's helpful is uh, compare it to its peers, because a lot of times if there's supply chain issues, they might be having similar ones. 
but what the people in my club, you know, they're big proponents of just picking up the phone and calling the company and saying, hey, why are your pre-tax profits going down for two, three quarters? Is there something going on that we should know about? And sometimes you can, you know, reach a person, you know, if you get, if you get the stockholder relations, sometimes they'll, they'll let you know what's going on. It can be kind of, kind of a fun way to, you know, really dive deep into your research. Another suggestion is you may want to take a peek um, at a possible competitor to see if they're, um, or I know Value Line has industry pages. Take a look at those to see if something's happening in the entire industry. Yeah, yeah good point. Bob is suggesting. <laughs> um, Chris, can you go online and pull one SSG and see how we can um, we can we can just pull out something and discuss a, a random one? Absolutely, great idea. I, I, Thanks, Bob. I, I have a question. Isn't when you see a trend develop maybe isn't that an indicator that you, you should try to understand why that trend is happening and what it might mean for the future? You know, I think we get very lost in how many quarters make up a trend. I mean, I think, you know, each of us recognize trends differently and, you know, manage numbers and graphs differently. And I don't think there's a one size fits all. I think that's why you have to watch companies. You have to, when you see something changing, you have to get a sense of why, whether it's going to the company's annual report and get an explanation. I think we get very locked into how many quarters do you wait? And I don't think that's the question. I think the question is, do you see signs of something changing and why? You know, you may spot it after one quarter, two quarters, you may spot it after three quarters or four quarters or five quarters. And the fact that it's going down for five for four quarters doesn't necessarily mean that that is an indicator that the company's in long-term trouble. There may be short-term issues. There may be a pressures affecting the entire industry. I mean, there are all kinds of things that you have to look at. I think we get very caught up in you know trying to come up with a one-size-fits-all rule in terms of num numbers of quarters, and I think that is a dangerous place to go. Very good point, Davi. Yes. Um, right. The the way all these things are a pieces of puzzle. We have to look all these things as evidence from different angles. Clues. You get to play detective. Yeah. <laughs> and but, that's where I, I think to his point, though. You know, the one size fits all, that's where you kind of may, you know, want to read research about the company. The the only downside of, of waiting for the annual report is it only comes out once a year. So that's where we're we're suggesting the quarterly data is going to give you four times a year to evaluate what's happening each quarter before that annual report comes out. Because by then, you know, everybody else is seeing the same thing in the annual report. So you may have to, you know, do a little research and dig a little bit deeper to find the quarterly numbers. But we're saying, uh, or we're suggesting that we think it's worthwhile, though. It's absolutely worthwhile. Um, but, you know, it really comes down to an issue of you've got to look for the information you need to understand what's happening with the company. That's, that's really the bottom line. Um, you know, and we get caught up around the BI in X number of quarters tells us something. Well, maybe it tells us we need to look. It doesn't tell us we should sell. And I think that, very, that's, very, that's my point. Very good point, yes, and well received, yes. Mm -hmm. So this one that I brought up is Alta Beauty. And I, I like to look at this one because we have this in my club and 
every it was everybody's darling you know it was so great and it was, and then all of a sudden covid came you can see oh it just fell off the cliff here and we lost money but if you look at the quarterly data that pre-tax profits been heading down 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 you could you should have probably potentially sold it well before the, the pandemic and not bought it again until you know recently whenever this is 2021 so you know if you would have sold it here you would have lost you would have missed out on a lot of this loss and then if you bought it around here you would have you know kind of picked up on some of its growth so it just shows such a different story right you don't even think you're looking at the same stock yeah yeah no that's very true i mean go back to the previous right if you look at this except for the 2020 dip it's continuously growing up the sales are up and but again i i, I think the better investing process is not get bogged down in a in a small little change in a short period of time. But as you can see, um, how it is behaving in the long term. And if you look at this right now, it looks like a pretty good opportunity to buy some of this if you don't already have it. Yeah, find another company that has uh, earnings growth of 25% in the last quarter, right? Yeah. <laughs> Does and, anyone have a stock they uh, want us to look at? Sorry. I mean, that's another thing that I, I think about is that, you know, we look at this and we see, you know, pre tax profit going up. We see earnings per share growing up, going up. And, uh, you know, oh, it may be a buying opportunity. But if you look at the price bar, they're, they're not going up that radically. And the current price is near the top. So we need to be careful about saying maybe we should buy because what is the PE? You know, the fact that pre-tax profit is going up doesn't mean it's on set. The company itself is on sale. It means the pre-tax profit is going up and there's potential for earnings to continue going up, but it doesn't mean that the company is on sale. And, you know, I think I've been kind of hearing this connection between pre-tax profit going up and it being a buy. I think there's a step missing, which is, you know, is it at selling at a reasonable PE? And, you know, this, if you look over time, the price bar seems to follow relatively closely to the, you know, trends in the pre-tax profit and earnings per share. And if that is the case, and that price bar for the current year is reasonable, then it's just probably expensive now because we're near the higher end of the price bar. Right. So even though things are going up, it may not be the time to buy this one. It may be expensive. Does anyone have a, a specific stock that you want to look at since we're here? So Mullet suggested NVIDIA. NVDA. Any moment now. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what's going on here. Phil, do you want me to let you want to share your screen instead? I don't know what's going on with my internet here. Let me see if I can get logged in. Okay. You may just want to just go back to the prior browser page and try it again because sometimes. I find that the site just for whatever reason hangs up on a company. And sometimes when you do it again, you get it. 
There it is. Good call, Lavi. You want to look at the quarterly data for these? Huh. Yeah, it's it looks like it's having serious problems with something the last couple of quarters. Yeah. Definitely. Something's going on. Is that the, they, I don't know, are these the guys that have the couple of Chinese factories or they they, yeah. they uh, send their chips to a couple of Chinese factories? I can't remember. Can we take a look at the sales on NVIDIA, please? So <clears throat> I think with NVIDIA specifically, part of their problem has been the way they've been accounting for their revenue and in terms of the chips so the big story was that they sell themselves as we're making chips for the gamers whereas most of the revenue came from uh, chips or bitcoin mining software and machines and since that's been going down that's impacted nvidia hard and a lot of their customers are being very unhappy and turning away from them so their revenues have been declining and that's caused other issues. Mm. Plus, the uh, expected um, deal with ARM didn't go through. So they're, they're going to be in trouble for a while. Well, once we're done with NVIDIA, I have a, I have a question. Sure, shoot. We can we can change this or we can just okay. Uh... If we can take a look at Adobe, I have a <clears throat> generic question. Um since Adobe's in the news right now, and I noticed there were several first cuts um done in the past month on Adobe as well. So and it also ties into quarterly data. But the question is I I have what I think is a process for this, but the question I have is when a company like Adobe acquires someone like uh, they acquired Figma and you're trying to make sense of the deal. And so you're trying to recrunch, you know, crunch the numbers again to say, okay, does this deal make sense? Especially if I hold the stock or if I'm looking at it, because here's the stock that's, you know, come down on valuations, looks attractive, uh, you know, historically it's been pristine, good management, and it has all the factors that you would expect out of us, you know, <clears throat> CEO just falls out of bed one day, pays 20 billion for something that is everyone's saying is way overpriced. So how does that, how will that, you know, what's, what does the picture, the financials now look like for on Adobe? And does anybody have ideas on how to crunch those numbers? How do you, how do you include Figma financials into Adobe to see what the picture now looks like in terms of, you know, some thinking in terms of okay, what do their new revenues look like? That's the easy one. What does the shares outstanding look like? That may take some research, but then you're trying to project what the EPS will look like, what their margins will look like. And from that, you, then you're trying to see, make a projection as to, you know, valuation. Does anyone have any good practices or process you want to share? I also posted this question to the uh, online community. Yeah, the uh, uh, as a topic for another, you know, somebody, maybe somebody can do a presentation on this. You know, I think there's some ways to approach this. Um, it's not easy. One approach you might want to take is look at each company's history of profit margins and do a hybrid based on the percentage of sales each company is going to contribute to the to the new company. In other words, let's say it, uh, um, the company it acquired is going to add 15% of the total sales, whereas the old Adobe is going to um, contribute 85% of the total sales of the new company. 
what you might want to consider doing is taking Adobe's pre-tax profit margin and multiplying that by 85% and then taking the other company's pre-tax profit margin, multiplying that by 15% and adding the two together, you get kind of a hybrid uh, pre-tax profit number for the moment. That's one way, that's one potential way to get a rough guess as to what profit margins are gonna look like. Right. That being said, mergers and acquisitions are really hard to evaluate. Uh, yeah, the hit and miss. Uh, you could do the companies individually, but there's going to be some cost benefits and whatever of combining. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of pretty complicated yeah. in doing it before they combine. Right, because you know we, we saw with like with um, Square, <clears throat> with, you know, it's called Block or whatever, when they made their acquisition of some company that paid thirty billion dollars, and ever since then Square's just been you know a no touch stock. And so, whereas like you know, Facebook purchased WhatsApp, overpaid for them, but really kind of saved Facebook. So it, it's a, uh, there's an element of chance when this happens. There's a whole community of people that hate Adobe that um, liked Figma because it wasn't Adobe is was its main, the main reason they wanted it. Um, it's easier to use in many ways, but um so trying to figure out that that um community response to this acquisition i think is really difficult well we know wall street didn't like it and cut the stock severely And that's just it. That could be a real, you know, when I see a price bar like this, I say, oh, huh, is that a deal? Is this thing on sale? Should we be looking at it? <laughs> yeah, this was, uh, Adobe's been subject to several first cuts and, uh, you know, the, all the ones I reviewed we had it in as a buy zone, but. And then the only other question that I have is if they've overpaid for the purchase, are they gonna to have to write down goodwill, which will then affect earnings per share and drop the earnings per share further? So, you know, you get into all those questions when you have an acquisition. Um, exactly. I mean, all of us, yeah. so many of us may who are old enough may remember the Time Warner AOL. Yeah. Debacle, yeah. Where, I mean, they just got killed because they just wrote off massive amounts of goodwill and it tanked the earnings. But one thing I see here is that at this moment, the market is not looking favorably at the future. Uh, now they could be wrong, but clear, you know, clearly with the price being, you know, at the bottom of the price bar. And I didn't go back in and look at what the, you know, the PE ratios are, um, but clearly, you know, the market is not valuing Adobe really high right now. So, you know, if you evaluate it and you think that there is a bright future, it could very well be a buying opportunity. But clearly, you want to make sure you, you understand what the market thinks and that the market isn't looking at this properly. Well, there's a lot of variables in the market, in the market right now with interest rates, with the 
um, Russian war, you know, so I think the whole market in general is trying to find whatever is normal these days, you know. Makes uh, stocks. Oh, there's no, there's no question we're in a, yeah, there's no question we're in a challenging uh, market to evaluate things because you know, if you look at it on the face of it, everything is so beaten up, everything looks like it's on sale. The question is, given where the market is, number one, is this a company that will survive um, and flourish? How long is it gonna take? Are there factors that are affecting it short term that might cause it to grow faster than the market when it the you know, the market itself when it recovers? So there's a lot, just so many things that go into it right now. Well, it looks like the most popular stock on the uh, past eight weeks buys list remains to be Amazon with a 10 to one favor in terms of the buy to sell ratios. So we bring up Amazon, take a look at it. The one thing I will say about the uh, the recorded buys and sells are that you're looking at a subset of BI members, which are the people who are willing to and, and do submit their information. Um, you know, so you know you get in a subset and you don't know the experience or knowledge of those people. So, you know, just because clubs are reporting that they're buying, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's really a um, an appropriate buy. You have to, you know, take the stuff with a grain of salt, and as they say, do your own homework, do your own research. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Is it? It is kind of fun to take a look at that list just to see what other people are looking at. Why is their profit tanking? They have supply chain issues also. They said that they um, were buy they bought up a bunch of um, inventory to replace all the stuff they sent out. Their inventories were very low. So they bought new warehouses, they bought new people. Yeah, they're doing a ton of building around here in the Boston area. I keep seeing new Amazon warehouses going up there all over the place. Yeah. Did, didn't Amazon do a new um, headquarters in Arlington, Virginia? Is that them or is that somebody else? Northern Virginia, yeah. Okay, any other thoughts about Amazon, comments? Anything else you want me to change or look at here? I'm just the driver, so just tell me what to do. You know, for me, you know, I would, to take a deeper dive than hey their their inventory was down because remember that if they're building or adding buildings that especially if they own them and rather than 
you know, they may be depreciated. That may not really be affecting the pro the pre tax profit all that much. So you really have to dig a little deeper and see if what yeah. you know what we're hearing makes sense. So going back to the uh, the topic of the meeting quarterly data. Um, so maybe this is a question for Sri Ram or the other panelists. Has anybody seen like a reasonable correlation between margin shrinkage and price or margin expansion and price? I think it lags a bit, right, Shiram? Not that's why quarterly data can be valuable because sometimes it takes a while for the price to catch up with what seems to be happening in the profit or the earnings side. Uh, Shiram, what what's your take on that? I think uh, Sam dropped off because his battery was gone. Going. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, he left his charger at a client's location, so he doesn't have the option of charging. <laughs> Maybe he'll join us by phone. Okay. Because, you know, even on the quarterly data, right, the margin information is going to be fixed at that uh, point of their last report. But pricing changes every day. Uh, but it is interesting because you can get a, lead, a run, a lead on sometimes, like, for example, there was the classic case earlier this year when um, the... Um, Russia-Ukraine conflict started out. McDonald's had announced that they were kind of you know, closing all their shops, but um, they still paid the staff. They still kept uh, all the all the uh, the, uh, the stores open for several months, six months, I believe. So they carried those expenses, and they had a downfall in their revenues. So, so in that instance, I mean, it wasn't a huge percentage. Um, overall in the global worldwide profits, but that told you something that, okay, so the revenues are going to come down, uh, but the expense lines are still going to stay where they're at. So that's going to, you know, collapse their margins um, for that segment of their services. Um, so like in Incognito, I think was saying, you have to keep an eye out on the news and, and translate that back into the financials to say, how does the model change and what's going to be, what does this mean, you know, looking at the next quarter or two? Yeah. And Al brings up a great point, like, you know, these popular stocks where there's a lot of retail activity and a lot of people in the market influencing the price who aren't doing the kind of data that, you know, research that we're doing, who aren't doing that kind of analysis. They just they know they like getting Amazon packages, so they're going to want to buy Amazon stock, regardless of what might be happening to profits or, or anything else. And that's the case with, you know, with the times that we're in, right? Robin Hood era, the Robin Hood era. <laughs> and the growth stocks have taken, you know, some of the biggest hits. But when the market turns, they're going to be participating in the greatest growth, too. So... You know, that's why I'm saying you got to be careful if you sell, when do you decide to go back in? Because then, then you have to make two right decisions. Yeah, your point earlier, Phil, was perfect that, you know, okay, you're going to sell this thing. What are you going to do with the money? <laughs> We're coming up on 9.45, just an FYI on time. Well, I think we're all good to, does anyone else have questions before we close the meeting? That was fast, fast hour and 15 minutes. Great, great input from everybody. These are, these are really fun for us. We like doing them. So uh, we hope <laughs> that you all like it too. Um, but if no one else has any questions, we, we can call the meeting to it. We can adjourn. Oh, I have somebody in the chat. Oh, thanks, Mo. We've loved having you here. Come back. Every, so these are every odd month. So the next one will be in uh, November. Yep. And it's always the third Wednesday. And it's always 830 Eastern time. So 
Thanks, Jane. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Yeah, with we um, you know, please come back and play with us again. <laughs> All right, you can stop the recording, probably. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>